This project was funded in part by the Florida Endowment for the Humanities with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and Southeast Fisheries Incorporated. Shrimp has been harvested and eaten for thousands of years. According to local oral tradition, the modern commercial industry traces its roots to Fernandina, a small fishing community in the northeast corner of Florida. They were gone when I, when I was growing up. The, the big fleets had gone. See, I was born in 28. I used to have to go to St. Augustine to get to see them. They also used to seasonally go fish Cape Canaveral. This was a fall season thing. Gino Litrico's father was a shrimper. He remembers the immigrants who helped begin the industry. Of course, like I say, you had the Italian Sicilians, you had the Greeks, uh, the Norwegians, uh, Portuguese, Portuguese, Romanian, Scottish brogue. It was, you know, it was a microcosm of coming up through Ellis Island in New York. <laughs> The, the thing that I kind of get about Fernandina is that it's sort of to the shrimping industry what Detroit was to the automobile. It wasn't invented there or here, but all of the major technological breakthroughs and improvements kind of were directly or indirectly associated with Fernandina. My father was mostly a seafaring man. However, he spent some time in New York working as a longshoreman before we came to Florida to engage in fishing. The main uh, production of shrimp was never found until about 1914, I suppose. Prior to those early years, uh, most shrimp were sold through uh, or sold in, in uh, bars. They were prepared and uh, I guess a lot of salt added to them <laughs> to, to make them uh, buy more beer in the process. And uh, there really wasn't a great uh, distribution of shrimp because very few people know what they were. The real boom in the evolution of Fernandina's shrimping industry was triggered by the adaptation of the otter trawl, a bag-like net with iron-weighted boards called doors to hold the net open on the bottom of the ocean floor. Back in them days, they'd lay your webbing out on a dock, put a board down, and just come along and just chop it out and whip it together. It was only just a, a well, like a two-seam net. That's all of a couple pieces of webbing slapped together. But uh, that's how come, and then it started shrimping. Well, then naturally, uh, the local people had these small boats and all, they all decided to go shrimping too. And that's the same thing one day, and he had a little boat. And, and uh, so he started shrimping, and like I say, he decided uh, one day my grandfather talked him into, why don't you get some webbing, Bill, make your own net? So he did, and 
it worked real good. So grandfather got him to build him one. It worked good, so it just kept on and on till he just finally uh, just got to make him own nets and let my uncle fish the boat. And he got on the hill and made nets. That's the way it started. Basically, you know, uh, a lot of what him and my father put into the business is still here. Just, just some uh, changes like the mongoose and just a little bit higher technology. Uh, pretty much family oriented, you know. All the family stayed in the business pretty much. Uh, I have uh, two brothers working with me, plus my father. My grandfather, he made uh, flat nets, which was a general all-purpose net. Most of the people at that time used it, and then he came up with uh, his version of a four-seam balloon net, which was another popular net, and they made two-seam nets also, which some people call two-seam flat nets. Then after that, my father, he came in with his interventions and uh, he added to the four-seam uh, little corner pieces, different little techniques of the net, and made it even better. So that, that was probably the most popular net for a long, long time. And then I came up with the mongoose, which was uh, a tongue type net and there was a net with a tongue that had a big hood over it which would give it even more lift. Uh, I came about the name because there was a fellow over there in the uh, Gulf area, Mississippi area, that built a net and he built a four seam balloon net and he put a tongue on it and he called it a cobra because of the hood. Well, you all know that the mongoose will eat the cobra up so I call mine a mongoose and it's done that. The crew members of a shrimp boat learn their jobs by apprenticeship and long hours of observation. Everybody started back there on the back. <laughs> you got to learn everything there is to know back there. We call a green home, we usually call him a deckhand, you know. And he'll work himself up to a strike or a rig man or something other like that. We didn't learn how to operate all the stuff back there, you know. It's nothing, it's not too complicated, you know, to learn. If you pay attention, you know, you do most of the same thing over and over, you know. And from then you work yourself up, you work yourself up till you make it to the wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah. are emptied on the back deck, the striker, or deckhand, begins the task of separating the shrimp from the trash fish pile. The captain helps. Once separated, the shrimp are placed in plastic baskets for washing and are then packed in layers of ice and stored below. 100 pounds of shrimp is referred to as a box. See, if everybody worked together, there ain't nothing to it. You just, you just got to, you know, you can't sleep like you do home. You got to get up. See, sometimes we work around the clock and you get your hour to nap. But I know I had a one fellow <laughs> working with me. He wanted to go learn how to shrimp, so I carried him out. We was on the West Coast then. And uh, I put over over about 8.30 that night, and I got ready to take up about 11.30, 12 o'clock. And I called him, he said, man, you must be crazy. <laughs> Waking people up out their sleep. <laughs> I told him, you ain't on no luxury ladder. You come out here to work. 
He said, I didn't know y'all didn't go pick up the daylight. I said, no, Bubba, we pick up every two hours. Yeah. <laughs> and he didn't make nary another trip. He quit. Your shrimpers back in those days relied mostly on markings, land markings on the hill. In other words, they would line up two smokestacks from a mill or a house, line up two trees that they've seen before, you know, different things like this to get their bearings of where they were at. We used to run from Tampa to Camp Eaton. Well, if you, when we pick up land on this side, it's something on the land you remember seeing, and you know whether you are Tampa or Tobin Springs or Sarasota or wherever, you know, and like that. But now you got little rams where you get on your line, you write line, and you come right to the seaboard. You know, it's just that simple now. Yeah. But uh, anywhere you go on the water, you're going to find a landmark somewhere you're going to remember. And it could tell you, it'll tell you where you're about to, just about where you're at. It's just something you pick up, you know. And it, it, it might be a big hump on the hill or something other you recognize. There's some tall pine trees on the hill where you say, well, let me, that's north of Jacksonville or something other, you know. It's, it's just something you learn. And when back in the old days, we had to learn it because we didn't have no other way of, you know, telling where you're located at and all. So. But now, like I say, we got modern equipment. All you do is get your little ran and go to your chart. And it, just like that, you're right on the spot there. It won't be two microseconds off. Now you got all this you know, modern stuff, you know. And then take up front the low rands and depth recorders and all that. We didn't have all that. We had sounding lines and stuff. Well, you may you put tie knots in the rope a foot apart, and you just drop it overboard till you feel it touch the bottom, and then you pull up and see how many foot of water you got, you know. That was a long time ago. They uh, would use what they call a, a soap stone or a soap uh, anchor. This is just a, a little piece of lead with a little hole in the bottom with soap in the bottom. Of it. And to find the, the right type of bottom that they expect to find fish or shrimp, they would drop this over the side and let it bounce on the bottom, pull it up and see what type of bottom they were on. And then they would make the drag, whether it be muddy or sandy or shelly or what. And then a lot of them went you know, uh, a lot by just measuring the depth with the same thing. They'll know how many fathoms of line they had. They'll drop it overboard and, and mark the spot where it stopped and go from that aspect of it. But after a while, you... Weather signs are used every day by fishermen and are based both on their own experience and natural factors, such as the sun, the moon, and the clouds. They got their certain areas that uh, is where most of the best shrimping is and, and that up around the Jaco wreck up there, that, and that and over the shows up there off of Cumberland, stuff like that. They know uh, just about when and where to go according to the weather and time of year and all. And they put it well right most of the time. Uh, full moon next month, that we're going to show up a few white shrimp there we, we can get going. We're looking for these roast shrimp and that, and that's when it, they show, they'll show around the moon, either the new moon or the full moon. Well, we just had the new moon in April, the 20th of April, I believe it was. They didn't show it in. So we're hoping on the full moon, which I think about the 8th of May, that, uh, that they'll, they'll show. But that's when you when you get your weather, Kelly. You get a northeastern rain and stuff, and we'll bring them on out the rivers. They say there's quite a bit of shrimp uh, way back up in the rivers there now. And of course, we haven't had any rain to amount to anything in that to bring them on out, wash them out. See, you generally get a blow around your moon, and that's what you need is a blow. Which, stirs the water up and everything, and that's what makes it better. Although most shrimp trawlers today are made of fiberglass or steel, a few traditional boat builders remain highly innovative wood craftsmen. Much of their work demonstrates that regional adaptation stimulates and encourages new forms of traditional expression. Well, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a little different than most of these boats here because if you notice, this boat has got a chime line. Uh, we call it a knuckle. Mm -hmm. uh, the rib comes out straight and then it goes up on whatever shear angle you want. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had both kinds. I've had a round bottom and a chime bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, I like this design better. It's more stable in the water. 
Uh, it's, it's a little quicker. You know, it don't roll like a watermelon and then come back. It, it kind of trucks you a little bit, but you can get used to that. Mm -hmm. I just don't like the watermelon bottom. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of it rolling, rolling, rolling. So I decided I'd build it this way. When you set the keel down on the blocks there, the stern has got to set lower than the bow because you, you, you can't draw as much water in the bow as you do the stern of a boat because you would push too much water in the bow of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it would slow your way down. She would uh, look bow heavy, so you raise it up a couple of feet maybe or something. Then after you do that, uh, you take a piece of live oak and cut the lock notches in there so when you put it in, it slides in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, that keeps it from coming out. The thing would stay there after you put the wedge in it without even putting a bolt in. Mm -hmm. Of course, you wouldn't want to go shrimping like that. <laughs> put some bolts in it, but it, it locks itself in. And that's the old Greek, that's the Greek notch. Mm -hmm. I got a bolt builder that uh, helped me uh, cut that bow stem out and uh, helped me lock the notch in there uh, from front end. He learned it from his daddy, and his daddy is the one that got it from the Greeks and then he learned me how to do it. So it, it's three-handed. Fiberglass is fine. It, it's light. It, it, you, the seas throw it around pretty good unless you uh, put a lot of weight in it. You know, uh, glass is, is real light. Steel is even lighter than this. This wood is the heaviest of the three. In my opinion, it's the strongest. Uh, you, you think, is wood stronger than steel? Boy, if you take a two by four, you can break it, and you take a piece of iron two by four, you can't break it. But the vibration and the twist and the bend and the wiggle, you know, you can take a wire and break it, you know. And it's, it's a lot of upkeep to a steel hull. You got to sandblast it and keep the rust down, because rust will eat it up. Of course, you got a disadvantage of wood. Uh, the worms in the water will eat this wood up. So you got to put a copper paint on the bottom, or tell you a good idea is to take red pepper yeah grind it up and put it in the copper paint and paint that and you'd be surprised the dangers and risks of open sea fishing have spawned a strong tradition of folk beliefs and legends among fishermen three of the major ethnic groups involved in florida's shrimping industry afro-american anglo-american and the Mediterranean American continue to share many of the same occupational beliefs while retaining a strong sense of ethnic identity. Well, a lot of people are superstitious. Now, I got a hang up about Friday. I don't like to leave the dock on no Friday. And a lot of people say it's superstitious and they had their best trip you know, by leaving on a Friday, but I never could make one on a Friday. <laughs> I've been tried it three or four times. I'm convinced that Friday just is bad luck day for me. But I see people don't want to bring a black suitcase on the boat and all that old stupid junk. But me, bad luck when I can't find me no shrimp. That, that, that's the worst luck it is. <laughs> I know I ain't going to make no money if I don't find no shrimp. Well, the majority of guys tell you don't turn that hatch cover up to the sun. Or the one of them, the, the hatch back there where we go down in the hole down there. Don't turn that up, cause it's up to the sun, cause the boat will sink. You know that, but that's an old thing. Yeah, a lot of guys don't want you to whistle on the boat. They don't say alligator on the boat. It's all kind of junk there, man. It's, I guess it's just as many now as it was back in them days. You know, the old days, it's the same thing. A lot of guys don't know. Don't, don't, don't do. Don't buy no salt and all kind of junk like that. It's bad luck to buy salt off another boat. <laughs> it's bad luck when you ain't got no salt. The old timers are real superstitious. They are very superstitious. There's some captains who would say, you don't say alligator on my boat. You can give me an example. One day I was on a guy's boat and I got to talking about the Florida Gators. They just went berserk. You know, they run me off of the boat. Don't you ever come back on here if you're going to say alligator on this boat again. And they were just superstitious the rest of the day. Well, that afternoon, they, they came out to my house, and we had dinner out there. And we went back to look and check on their boat and everything. And they had tied it up 
with their spring lines too short. The tide dropped and the boat was just hanging sideways on the dock. And they, they said, see what I told you? I said, that's all bull. You tied the boat up wrong. That's all that was. A frequent theme in Stories of the Sea concerns the belief that the dead return to haunt the spot where they died. Yeah, well, well, the old timers say that they see a, when the weather could get rough down off the, to the east of us from here, that uh, there once in a while they'd see a old sailing vessel come by and it'd be real bad weather. And uh, they'd see it come by and then it'd go out of sight and it wouldn't see it no more and that kind of stuff. Heard about it from the old timers years and years ago, uh, but uh, it just show up and then it just disappear. You wouldn't see it no more. I feel like there's a lot of things that goes on now that if, if we was not so busy, we'd see. Uh, I've seen some things when I'd be out on the boat myself that were unexplainable, but you don't tell, say too much about them because people say, oh, you're crazy, you know. But we're a special breed of people. Uh, all the fishermen are. And I feel like that we observe things in nature that average person overlooks. I mean, a lot of people don't even realize that they do it, but we do. I know David has seen things that, that couldn't explain. I'm sure he has, and I have too. Uh, we just accept them. They're just part of, just part of life. everything's out on the water there and you just don't know what it is so you don't see nothing. I saw an occurrence and I never said very much about it that was similar to that but it was in the bay and it never got close enough for me to really see it but it was right down off of town off straight out from the city marina and, it, and I watched it come in from the gulf and it come in and it went across to a bar where it's shallow there's no way a ship that big could have crossed it. And it appeared to be a big schooner type, big sailing ship of some type. And uh, to me, there's no explaining it away. It was a ship come in there and went across that bar. But I don't know what it was. And, and I was curious about it, but I never said much about it because when you talk about stuff like that, people say, oh, you're crazy. So you just don't talk about it. But this vessel, come in from the old past, just like as if it would have done 100 years ago, and it come in and it crossed Courtney Point, and Courtney Point is too shallow. And when it crossed, it went behind the day markers and stuff, went right on up the bay, up towards St. Andrews, and then it just wasn't there. Uh, <clears throat> it give you chill bumps, I tell you that, when you see something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Contemporary functions of the rituals still found in Florida shrimping communities operate essentially as they did in the past to help man cope with the uncertainties of working in a personally hazardous environment. It is a tradition. All the children, distant, extended, extended family, you know, the black folks have an extended family. And like yesterday, we, uh, we fed about probably 100 people over at the house. It happens every year. Folks come, look forward, and, and we have a good time. You know, we get together and fraternalize. Uh, when I first uh, knew about the blessing of the feet, was, I was in Louisiana, and it was quite an impressive event. And uh, the people made quite a festival occasion of it, just like they have here. After all, when they're out there exposed to the to the uh, storms and to the seas and rough weather and so forth. It felt like maybe a little bit of invoking God's guidance would bring them home and they ever get caught out there in a, in a very tough situation.
<laughs> Don't fall off the sink. observed over the last 15 years of our lifetime, actively involved in the business, is a decline in the number of species from our point of view. And as I travel up and down, because I don't, I don't spend the time on the boats like they do now, I notice yeah. that there's an increase in the use of um, agriculture in terms of chemicals, the golf courses and the fertilization. And I think that um, it has a detrimental impact on, as well as when you look at the estuaries, OK? Um, that has the effect of reducing, I think, the reproduction of the shrimp. The other thing is that you got a lot of people using seines now in the rivers catching them when we didn't have to worry about that before, and that's where the shrimps are basically uh, cultivated. And so they catch them before it hits the ocean. Where the future is, I don't know. Right now, the industry is in very bad shape, very poor shape. We've got uh, people that are not going to survive this year. This season will eliminate a lot of fishermen, but I feel like there'll be some of it will last. But a lot of my friends are gonna be out of the shrimp business next year because they're not gonna survive this year. For the simple reason, the prices are so cheap until they cannot afford to, to operate. I guess the, the old saying is that uh, once you get the salt in your blood, you just don't get it out of it. Just like we say, if you get sand, you shoes in Florida and you can't. You always come back. It's just there, and you just ain't nothing you can do about it. Well, I've had uh, some of the old fishermen, or not maybe the older fishermen, but some of the older ones would say, uh, man, the, the fishing has been so bad, you know, so bad for the last three or four years, and especially last year. You must be crazy, you know, building a shrimp boat. So Wally told Noah he was crazy too, you know, <laughs> but he wasn't, and I don't think I am. <laughs> so, yeah. I believe it's going to come back to the way it used to be, but I think the smaller boat is what's going to come back to this coast. Uh, the, the bigger boats, super slabs we call them, uh, I believe is uh, just about the thing in the past mm -hmm. for this coast here because it, this coast just don't produce enough of shrimp. Mm -hmm for a big boat like that. So that's one reason I'm building a boat this side. And I just never went into nothing else. Fishing all my days.